Hello and welcome to the Cisco CyberOps Associate Lab video series. I'm going to be walking through each of the major labs of the Cisco CyberOps Associate NetaCAD curriculum. So let's go and let's jump on in. All right, so in this lab, we are looking at lab 4.5.4, navigating the Linux file system and permission settings. So we're going to be looking at our cyber ops, just like all of the other videos. We will be looking at the official cyber ops curriculum. I will have the lab steps off on one side. I will have the VM on our display and we'll work through the lab together. All right, let's get logged in. Again, password is CyberOps. It will refresh, go full screen. We are, again, lab navigating the Linux file system and its permissions. There are three parts of the lab. We're gonna be going through all parts, so exploring the file system, file permissions, and part three, symbolic links. And we're just gonna work through them. Again, my instructions are off on another page, but we're just going through the official lab curriculum. We're using the CyberOp workstation. That's what we have open. That's what we have logged into. So part one, exploring the file system in Windows. Again, Linux file system has done uh, one of the more popular uh, features. While Linux does support many different types of file systems, almost all of them are based off of the X family, EXT family. It's one of the more common file systems found on Linux. So let's Part one, step one, open your VM, open a terminal. That's the end of step one. And I don't know why I clicked on the web browser because I did not mean the web browser. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in a few times. And I will maximize my screen. All right, so step two of part one, display the file system's current mounted. So we want to do what mounts are there, what, what volumes are actually present. So we're going to do an LSBAK. That will tell us what our disks are and what's mounted underneath them. Here we have a SBM with one gig and the volume underneath that. So here is our physical disk and here is our partition. Physical disk and there's the partition. And you're going to notice this will go ahead and list all of our volumes or our partitions. And this will tell you the mount point if there is a, a specific one. The output above, that's this one, does show our workstation. This one has two blocks. The lab document has three. It has a source zero. We don't have that in our VM. We have an SDA and an SDB. It does a tree-like structure. The conventional uh, dev SDX is used by Linux to represent what's going on. So, uh, yep. Uh, their trailing numbers will represent the partition number. So if we have multiple partitions, we can see them. All of these are underneath our dev group. So we may see dev SDA, dev SDB, and so forth. By default, the output will imply the SDA and SDB are hard drives, physical disks, each one containing a single partition. SDA is typically 10 gig within uh, our VM and SDB is about one gig, that's what we have. Note, Linux often will say uh, USB drives as SDX as well. So again, might be SDC or, or so forth, depending on their firmware type. All right, so that's step 2A. Step 2B is to go ahead and mount something. So we're gonna use the mount command. And we can see all of our mount options. Process, system, dev, run, dev1, our temps, our groups, and so forth. Dev 
SDA1, which is our 10 gig disk, which is our type X4. So that gives us some detail. That's our file uh, type, our file system. Part 2C, we can actually uh, break this down a little bit more detail like if we do a mount and we do a pipe again the pipe is above enter we could do grep sda1 and that way we can focus or narrow down into a fewer amount of lines of code and so here we have our single sda1 if we did grep and we did let's do cg group cg group it will focus on whatever we are grepping. So it's not saying a line, it's basically saying search for this keyword and display all within a the purpose of grep. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and clear. Again, with our SDA one or whatever we are grepping, again, SDA block device, that is essentially our physical disk. And then we can see that the mounting point is at forward slash. The output will also tell us the type of format used, what type of partition, and that should be our X, uh, ext4. So now let's go and let's look at some more things. Let's go and let's do a cd slash. So I'm gonna do an ls first. This is where I'm currently at. I'm in my user folder. If I do an l or a cd slash. My location is slightly different. I'll, I'll do an ls. I've moved up to my root directory. So ls underneath my analyst user, that'd be our user, and then, or sorry, it'd be under our home, then our appropriate user. As the forward slash, that is our root, and we can see the high level directory. So I'm gonna do a cd home. LS, I see my analyst. LS, so I'm back to my original location looking at my analyst's home directory. I'll go back to my main slash for my main directory. LS gives us our directory. LS tag L will give us our directory but with permissions. Uh, how we read this again is if this is a directory or file the next three are our user permissions the next three are group permissions and then the last three are special permissions read write execute read no write but execute read no write and execute so that's how we read that all right, that takes care of 2D. So why is dev SBD1 not shown in our output? Whether we were looking at our mounts or whether we were looking at any other information. That is because while it only listed the disks and partitions that are actually mounted. So I did miss a question. One of the questions is what is the meaning of the output where the files are physically stored that would be the ls command so the the cd command change directory space forward slash that takes us to our root drive ls tac l that gives us a detailed breakdown of our permissions so again that forward slash is also known as our root directory by listing the files in the root directory you can see the actual listing files are physically stored in the root of our SDA file. So we can see the physical path. All right, so that answered both of those questions in, at the end of step two. Step three is manually mounting and unmounting a file system. So if we do CD squiggly line, and we do an ls tac l we can see 
where we're located. And we can see some type of second drive. And we see that as this directory right here. That is step three, part A. Part B is, let's do an ls on that directory specifically. So ls tag l, second drive. Hit enter. There, nothing there. Notice that the directory is empty. It's just what it is. Uh, can we mount it? Is there information in there? So there may be. So that is part three C, is we are going to be mounting it and assigning it to our SDB1 directory. So what we're gonna do is, first of all, we definitely need a sudo. sudo mount location dev sdb1 squiggly line forward slash second drive we will have to do the password because we are doing our sudo give it a minute oh. cyber ops all right you have to use the correct password no output means it was successful. So now that we have the SBDB1 mounted, we can see if it's there. So ls tac l second drive, we can see that there's files that are there. It's now been mounted. So why is the directory no longer empty? Because we've mounted it and allows us to load it. Where are the listed files physically stored? That's a good question. After the mount, so it should be the home analyst second drive. After you've actually mounted that, the entry point of the file system or the physical drive is stored in dev sdb1. So now, Let's look at our mount again. I'm going to clear it. Mount. You'll notice the last thing we did was our mount. We could also do a sudo mount. Oh, sorry, you know, I didn't mean to do sudo. So we could do sudo grep dev. I'll just do that for now. So we have our dev, we have a temp, so I'm gonna do a dev sdb. Now we have our sdb. If I do a dev sd, it should bring up both a and b, and it does. And then it shows you the location. All right, that takes care of 3B. The grep takes care of 3E. Now, let's go ahead and take care of 3F, which is unmounting the drive. So, sudo umount or unmount dev sdb1. That will unmount it. You'll have to do a password. If it doesn't prompt you for a password, it's still just being cached. So if you give it time, it will eventually reprompt you. Now let's see if that drive is available. So ls tac l, second drive. It's no longer mounted, it's no longer readable. So it doesn't show you anything. So you can think of it like when you plug a USB drive and you've already ejected it, but the drive is still physically connected, it's there, but it's not readable. You've not connected back to that drive, so it's not showing detail. And that's essentially what we are doing here. That is the end of part one of this lab.
So let's move on to part two, which is file permissions. So we already kind of looked at our permissions, but we're going to go more in depth in this section. The Linux file systems have a lot of built-in features that control the ability, what you can view, change, navigate, and execute within the file system. Essentially, each file in a file system carries its own set of permissions. Everything is an object, and almost everything has assigned permissions. So let's go and let's navigate to a script directory. Part 2, Step 1, A. Navigate to the Home, Analyst, Lab Support Files, Scripts directory. All right, so clear ls. I'm in my directory. So we're going to go ahead and do a cd lab. So lab files scripts ls. See what's there. We have a bunch of scripts that are already preloaded for us. Let's do a ls. Tack L to look at the permissions of these items. Again, the green or the white are typically object or their files. Our bluish is a directory. We can also see within our permissions it has the D that lets us know it's a directory. So what's going on with the PSYOP MN? Who's the owner of this object right here. So the owner is analysts and the group is analysts. The next question is the permissions for PSYOP are TAC RW TAC R TAC TAC R TAC TAC. No directory, read, write, no execute. Read, no write, no execute read, no write, no execute. So the owner of the file, the analyst, can read and write to the file but not execute. That's the TAC RW. The next is the member of the analyst group, so the group is going to be TAC R. No exceptions are writing is allowed. All other users are not allowed to write or execute the file. We've pretty much just allowed read access. So that is the question at part two, step one, the end of B. So let's go ahead and let's touch a file. So step one C is touching a file. So we're going to do touch mount. Oh, yep, touch. There we go. M N T mount my new file. Make sure to spell it correctly. Dot txt. Cannot touch that location. Our permission is denied. We don't have the permissions to look at that or to create in that directory. So let's double check our permissions. So the best way to do that is we can use the tack D to see what's going on. That way we can see what permissions are in that location. So ls tack l d forward slash mount. So here we have a directory and it is both root and root. So the permissions of the mount directory is owned by the user root with the permissions of read, write, execute. Read, execute, read, execute nor group or other have the right ability. They can only read and execute from that directory. Only the user is allowed to write to that folder. So what can be done to touch a file in the above location? How can we make it successful? That's easy. We can elevate our permissions or we can modify. So if we do a sudo at the very beginning, Put in our password, cyber ops. Then we can do an ls of that location and we can see that our file is there. So there, there are some things. So what can be done uh, for touch? 
you can always sudo and make it run as a new user. You can do chmod and that's modifying permission. That's another way. And that's what we're talking about in part one. Uh, step D is in dog. The chmod command is used to change permissions. Just like before, let's go and let's mount our partition so that we can do some modification. All right, so I'm going to clear my screen and I'm going to go ahead and do a sudo mount dev sdb1 squiggly line second drive. All right, so ls. Well, we're still in the scripts folder, so that doesn't really help. So let's change our directory to our new location, squiggly line, second drive, now do ls. All right, so we have our lost and found, and we have our new myfile.txt. So let's go and do an ls tag l. Let's look at our permissions. Our analyst owns our my file the group is root and we can look at the permissions we uh, we have read write no execute we have read write no execute for the group and special is read and execute all right so we have mounted it that's d we have navigated to it that is e we've answered the question what are the permissions so now we're going to use chmod to modify it. So how these rules are is they are a number and they actually all add up like read write execute add up to seven and you're gonna notice if oh, actually I'm just gonna show you the word document So when we do read, write, and no execute, so read, write, no execute, six. Read, write, and execute would be seven, but essentially we're looking at three bits. So we're doing three bits for each of these. And if they add up to seven, that is read, write, execute. If they add up to six, it would be read and write. If it's four, then they only have the read access. If you want five, it would be read and execute only. So th there are reasons for that binary conversion. It's not just networking. A lot of OSs have that binary conversion as well. So with that said, let's do a ch mod. And we have to say what file we are modifying. So we are doing permissions 665 for my file. So we've now modified it. Read, write, read, write, read, execute. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to chmod the sixes. And instead, I now have read, write, read, write, read, write, because I did the chmod 666. If I chmod 4 and 4, there now will be read, write, read, read. All right, so let's go ahead and let's put that back to what they should be, 665. All right, I'm going to clear my screen back to the top. If you have any issues, you can do a chmod and you don't have to say uh, the owner, but, but you can. We can also use a sudo chown and that will change the owner. So analysts. Make sure to spell the name correct. What are we changing the owner to? And if we do an ls tag l, the 
owner is analyst. We can modify that however we want. So we're looking at the end of G. We're reading the note. To change both the owner and group to the analyst at the same, same time, we could do a pseudo own analyst colon analyst. So you, I'm going to do the up arrow. If we do a colon and we do analyst again, that would be user and group. LS again, and there we go. Users first, colons the group. We can also inject some data into it with a set of arrow keys. So we're going to do echo tests. One is to push into. Two is as a pinned. My file dot text. No, oh, you have to spell echo correct. All right, you may have to. Uh, sudo it if you if you have to then go ahead and put the password otherwise let's cat my file so if we did one arrow it would fully replace everything if we did two arrows it would then append it so test two append means add to the bottom that's all that means. So that takes care of H. Was the operation successful? Well, yeah, we are the owner. So we're logged in as analysts. So we are the owner of this object. So we can actually read and write to that directory and to that object. All right, part two, step two. Let's look at directories and permissions. So let's go ahead. Let's CD. CD squiggly line. I want to go back to our labs directory. Labs file. LS tag L. We can see what's here. Again, anything that starts with a D is a directory. So compare the permissions of the malware directory with the minset service file. What's the difference? So malware is a directory. We have the read write. Execute for the, the user, read, no write, no ex, and execute for our group, and we have a read, no write, and execute for our other. For the Mininet service, not a directory, we have a read, write, execute, and then we have a read, no write, execute for both the uh, group and our other. So there is some slight differences between the two. The big one is one's a directory, one's not. That's what you can see. Again, the letter D at the beginning lets you know that it is a directory. All right, that's the end of part two. Let's wrap up the last part, part three, symbolic links and other special file types. So I'm going to show you the Word document. So again, regular files that are readable files, binary files, image files, compressed files, they will all start with attack. Directories or folders will end with a, or begin with a D, and they'll list the permissions. Special folders might have a B, a character's device file will have a C, a pipe file will have a P, a symbolic link will have an I, Sorry, an, an L. A socket file will have an S. So files are used to link within the directories are symbolic links, either a soft link or a hard link. So let's look at and examine these details. So first thing is they don't want us to be in this directory, so I'm going to go ahead and CD up. LS. So, Cyber Ops Desktop. Alright, 
good enough. So let's do an ls tag l. We can see the directories with the d. We can see the files with the normal minus. So now that is part three, step one, a. That wraps up that. So let's go ahead and let's look at some other files that might have some other information. ls tag l forward slash dev. Notice some of these start with C. Again, that's going to be the symbolic links. Sorry, uh, character files. The L's are going to be our symbolic links, and our B's will be blocked files. I see these are directories. Notice the color. Here we have a few L's. Again, notice the color. They are clearly different. We have a D. Read, write, execute. Read, write, execute. Read, write, T. So that's a special one. And then D, D, D. I'm not seeing any Bs. But I see a lot of Cs. Oh. These are blocked access. So essentially they're, they're things that uh, are mounted so that we can actually access them. Because again, even our disks are objects. So that is three, step one, A. Now let's go ahead and that was B as, as well. Symbolic links, again, are our L's, and they are essentially shortcuts. So in Windows, that's essentially what it is. It's a symbolic link. So let's go ahead and let's see if we can do one. So echo. We're going to do symbolic. Sim. B-O-L-I-C. Quote. We're going to add that to file one.txt. We're going to cat that file. We see the word symbolic. All right, we'll do echo hard file two two.txt. We will cat file two. We see that it's hard. So now, can we combine the two? So that was essentially part three, step one, C, creating the files. D is we're going to use LNS to connect the two. All right, so let's go and do that. L in tac s. We want to go ahead and do file one dot txt. We're going to go ahead and do file symbolic sim b o l i c. That creates our symbolic link. So that takes care of that guy. L in file two dot txt. And we're going to do file too hard. File too hard. So again, uh, normally the L in tac s creates a symbolic link. So we're linking. A symbolic link to file one and the ln will create a hard link not a symbolic link to our text file two so let's double check what we can see ls tag l with our symbolic link it will tell you where the links are with our file too hard you don't get to know the original location 
Notice that the file uh, one symbolic link, different color. It shows you the location. So let's cat file symbolic. Es essentially, that's just a shortcut to that file one. So if we move our file, so we're now working on F. So file1.txt to file1new.txt move file2.tx to file2new.txt Now let's cat our symbolic link again shortcuts gone but if we can't file too hard it's still there that's what I mean by a hard link meaning if you move the file the the, the shortcuts just gonna find it a symbolic link is a soft link it's not gonna search for it that is because file2 appears to be a regular file. It's in fact a regular file that happens to point to the same inode on the disk as file2. In other words, file2hard points to the same attributes and disk block located as file2.txt. So the number 2 in the fifth column is listing the same file. So there are some questions. What do you think would happen to file too hard if you open a text editor and change the text in the file to new.txt. They're linked together, so if you modify one, it, it, it's, it's both. All right, reflection. File permissions and ownership are two of the more important aspects of Linux. Navigating and understanding what you're looking at is also another big one. That LSTAC-L is critical so you can understand where you're at what permissions you have, and for essential navigation. There's also common problems that you can help fix. A file that has the wrong permissions or ownership will not be available to programs if they are needed. So understanding how to modify permissions with chmod and chown is important. Also being able to change both the account owner and the group owner is important. So understanding that ch own the colon component we did where we did ch own analyst colon analyst that changed the owner the individual and the group so those are important aspects of linux all right so that is the end of this lab again this was lab 4.5.4 navigating the linux file system and permission settings if there's any questions, please let me know. All right, so that does it for this lab video. A few suggestions would be, one, run through the lab a second time, trying to do it by yourself. Two, I would do a summary of kind of what you learned, where you struggled, and keep that type of journal going so that you can build off of it. Third, and finally, take time to reflect. These labs start off fairly easy and then they grow in complexity. So some of the labs you may have to redo a few times to fully grasp what's going on. If you have any questions or any concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.